Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar for this afternoon titled PH to Space, Ascent to Inspire. My name is Edgy Gallios, and I'll be your host for this event. The Aerospace Engineering Department has prepared a wonderful program for us this afternoon as we take a glimpse into the present and future of space endeavors right here in the Philippines. Space is an exciting topic for most. A bit trivial, trivial for some. Um, some would argue, why space? Uh, why spend your money out there, up there, 400 kilometers above the Earth's atmosphere, and why not here? Well, it shows us that there are some who are against the idea of Filipinos taking up space endeavor as, as a lifestyle. But just recently, 3 million Pinoys signed up for NASA's program of Send Your Name to Mars, which shows up that there is a growing, grow, a, a growing inspiration, a, a growing need or want for us to actually learn more and finally to travel to space. Ancient Filipino pirates in the 12th century, they went and spread havoc in the Chinese shores. Astronomy in the daily lives of ancient Filipinos was described by Dante Abrosio in his book, Balatic, wherein we showed that space indeed had a space in our lives. So for this afternoon, we will be joined by three of the main movers of our space endeavor with FILSA, the Philippine Space Agency. Namely, we have Engineer Salases of the Maya One. We have Engineer Violan, who helped develop our first microsatellite, Diwata One, and the first Director General of FILSA, Dr. Marciano. So I'm so excited for this afternoon. I don't know about you. So to start, let's first uh, begin with a prayer. So I'll be giving you, I'll be turning you over to our one of our own aerospace engineering student, Joshua Morales, for his opening prayer. Let us put ourselves in the presence of God in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Dear God, we praise and thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to host this educational virtual talk. We come to you this hour asking for your blessing and help as we are gathered together virtually. We pray for guidance in the matters at hand and ask that you'll clear our minds away from distractions. Give us the desire to learn from our guest speakers and excel in our field. May the flow of our program be as consistent as the love that you have brought upon us. Give us strength on these challenging times. May we overcome it together and fully live out our purpose in life. Through Christ, we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that, Joshua. And to stop to continue with the program, the Philippine National Anthem, to be followed by the IAU hymn. Can 
October 1957, the Sputnik rocket was finally launched into space. An ICBM filled out with various equipments sent out more than 300 kilometers above space, orbiting around, which showed the technical difficulties of bringing a 100 kilogram payload all the way up into space. In 1980s, the Philippines acquired its first satellite, the Aguila One. And in 1997, some of you might have lived that time now, Aguila Two, the first Filipino launch satellite, which was launched in China. It marked the Philippines endeavor into space. One of the strongest, one of the highest coverage satellite during that time, a geostationary satellite. The Aguila 2 provided us with years of data which gave the Filipinos so much more than we spent. But finally in 2009, it was sold and for a while the Philippines had none. It wasn't until 2016 where the Wata 1, our first micro satellite was finally launched into space, built and designed by Filipinos for Filipinos. And after two years, in June 2018, Maya 1, our first cube and nano satellite was launched. Both satellites re-entering this year, the Wata 1 in April 2020, and Maya 1 in November, just last month, November 23, 2020. Maya 2, our next cube satellite, was just recently handed over to JAXA and will be launched soon enough and i'm happy to tell you that two of the developers two of the designers of those micro satellites that i mentioned 
engineer salsas of Maya One and engineer violin of Diwata One will be with us this afternoon. And also our guest speaker for the day, our first ever Director General of Filsa, Dr. Marciano. So this is going to be a first of its kind in the history of Indiana Aerospace University. And as such, allow me to welcome, allow me to introduce our ever supportive, ever patient and ever active CEO, Mr. Harold Turing for his welcome address to for us to start our program formally. Sir Harold. Eji, can you hear me, Eji? Yes, sir. Can hear you, sir. Loud and clear. Yes, um, before I, I open, formally open this uh, virtual seminar, allow me, airspacers. It's very much, I'm very much honored and privileged to have with me, beside me, is the owner and founder of Indiana Airspace University, Dr. Joven Alturing. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Dr. Turing, for your presence. Thank you. Um, the IAU faculty, administrators, guest speakers, students, the aerospace community, good afternoon. <clears throat> On the occasion of this virtual talk, Philippines to Space, Ascent to Inspire, I welcome you all. <clears throat> This afternoon brims with joy and excitement as our students, our beloved aerospacers, are going to be introduced to the different aspects of Philippine space endeavors in the hope of opening doors for them to pursue diverse graduate studies and career opportunities in the space industry. <clears throat> It is by this time, it is by this same token that Indiana Aerospace University expresses its full support and unwavering commitment to the advancement of aviation and space science in the country by providing holistic aerospace and not just aviation education. Things, this brings me to what our founder and president, Dr. Jovenel B. Turing, has always envisioned for us and the country to launch a truly competent and world-class aerospace industry. Space science is the future, my dear aerospacers. As a matter of fact, it enhances our day-to-day -day transactions by invigorating research and scientific discoveries, all for the betterment of humankind, especially as we are ushering the age of the fourth industrial revolution, oh, no, no. where smart technologies feel, fuel the quality of life. Moreover, space science to quote the European Space Agency, is a subject that strives to answer the ultimate questions. How did, that, did our Earth and our solar system form and evolve? What is our place in the universe? Where are we going? Where did life come from? And are we alone? May this afternoon's virtual talk invites us to an odyssey into space. Who knows, some of you here will become an astronaut, a space scientist, technologist, engineer, or researcher. Is that possible? Yes, of course, because you can do it. Sabi nga ni former Senate President Aquilino Coco Pimentel, during our 25th commencement exercises, what makes you phenomenal 
is that if others are still looking at the sky, IAU is already looking at the moon. Once again, once again buckle up and enjoy the ride. Mayong hapon sa tanan. Thank you for that, Sir Harold. And um, before we continue, allow me to ask everyone, our, all our participants, to kindly mute your microphones to ensure that our program will not be um, needlessly disrupted. So kindly mute your microphones uh, and please do use your full name, your complete name as your, as your handle here in Zoom. So again, I would like to remind everyone to please mute your, your microphones if with the duration of our program. Okay, to continue, um, in this, at this point, allow me to introduce our South Directress, Maria Luz Kayagan, as she opens the panel and gives her introduction of our two guests for this afternoon. Ma'am Luz? Ayan. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to our esteemed guests, to all CYAE members and alumni, our CYAE advisor, Mr. Edgy Gallios, our department head in the AE department, Mr. Johnny Destacamento, our dear instructors, school administrators, Dr. Nonita Ligaspi, our dean of colleges, Mr. Harold Turing, our chief executive officer, and of course, our dear president, Dr. Jovin Alperin. It is my distinct honor to introduce to you our esteemed guest speaker for today's webinar. Our first speaker recently obtained his Doctor of Philosophy in Engineering from the Kyushu Institute of Technology in September 2020 with specialization in space engineering. While doing his PhD or doctorate degree, he was also involved as a core team member of the Birds 2 project, which was an interdisciplinary multinational team member of the Birds 2 project, of the CubeSat project involving graduate students from the Philippines, Bhutan, Malaysia, and Japan. As the Birds 2 member, he experienced the overall process of a satellite project that involved the mission planning, satellite design, building, launch, and operation of Maya 1, the first of a series of educational CubeSats of the Philippines. Along with identical CubeSats, one of Bhutan and UI2M Sat 1 of Malaysia. His PhD dissertation topic focused on nanosatellite store and forward communication systems. He obtained his BS Electronics and Communications Engineering and MS Electrical Engineering degrees from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Aerospacers, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Engineer Adrian T. Salces, Doctor of Philosophy in Engineering. I packet of the killer makeup and I'm not going to put it back in the
Hi, Sir Adrian. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry for the uh, technical problem. I was muted all earlier. Right. Uh, first of all, all right. I'd like to thank the students, faculty, and staff of the Indiana Aerospace University for this uh, distinct honor and privilege to be able to share with you this afternoon. Uh, for my talk, I just want to share uh, some personal experiences and insights from my graduate space engineering program, as well as from my uh, practical hands-on experience in the Bridge to Satellite project. So my outline would be first, I want to share with you uh, what launched me into a space engineering career and what, did, what made me to decide to pursue it. And also after that, I'll give you uh, some background about the Bridge to Project, uh, what we did uh, in the project, in, in the development of the satellite, and then I'm going to highlight an important point with respect to the uh, lean satellite development approach, which was adopted in the program. And finally, uh, summary, uh, give, give you some uh, list of uh, insights that I gained from the, from the project. So I was introduced earlier, but uh, I'm showing these uh, slides just to really to point that uh, I, really, I did not really as a space engineer. So I graduated in UPD in 2013 and my background was, was really in uh, wireless communications engineering. And uh, so until, until 2014, uh, until 2016, I was doing uh, research in this particular field. And also it was during this time when the Diwata program was uh, was being uh, initiated by the by the DOST and also uh, being proposed to be implemented at UPD. So I was a faculty member at that time. And then I decided to change career and uh, to pursue a uh, specialization in, in space engineering. So that's why in, in, for four years in 2016 to 2020, I went to Japan to pursue uh, space engineering. And that's where I was also part of the project that built Maya One CubeSat, which, was, which is the first CubeSat of the Philippines, which uh, decayed back to orbit, uh, back to Earth in uh, in November of this year. So now, what led me to, to pursuing a graduate study in space engineering? Uh, at that time, there was a vision to become space capable, and and uh, incidentally, uh, while I was in UPD, I was involved in the early stages of the Field Microsoft program, which was the predecessor program of the S4S program. So at that time, uh, I was involved in uh, I mean, assisting my professor in the, in the planning of the activities and, and so on. And uh, actually, for, for most of us, nobody knew what exactly uh, should be necessary in, in, in order to be able to, uh, how to say, to build a satellite, okay? But uh, it was uh, very interesting. So uh, sooner I, I started to become very interested in, in the topic. So I thought that it would be worthwhile pursuing. And uh, at that time, um, the, micro, the micro satellite Diwata one was already on the pipeline. And we already sent uh, engineers to to two Japanese universities, and they started working the for the satellite. And then a few months or uh, one year later, so there was a, another opportunity, a PhD scholarship, and this scholarship came with an opportunity to build the first CubeSat. So it was not originally programmed, but it was later born out uh, because of uh, developments that. Uh, would require further expertise. So uh, what I mean by that is, yes, we already were building a microsatellite, but it was also important to start developing expertise in uh, testing these uh, small satellites. So it's one thing to be able to um, 
to build a, a cube site, it's, all, all, it's also important to build the expertise to be able to test them to be to work properly in space. And that's where uh, the, that's where uh, the good prospect came in. So by going to this uh, project, so not only would I be able to experience a building a cube site, but also fulfill the need to develop this expertise. And as I mentioned, it was not really, uh, space was not really my specialization or focus. So it was a challenge, at, at, but it, uh, I didn't have to start from scratch. So uh, on hindsight, we realized that, yes, we, we, we don't really, our country didn't have a, a strong, you know, experience or capacity in space, but we, we also have uh, engineering that should be, uh, that should be fine because, you know, it, space has a lot of fields, or a lot of disciplines. So it, it is very multi multidisciplinary and inter interdisciplinary. So it, engineers from various backgrounds can actually work on, on specific parts of the satellite. And then, uh, so they work together to build the whole and also there was a strong support and encouragement. So I was not alone. So if I was around there, it, was, it would be very, you know, uh, frightening to, to go into this journey. But I was part of that group dreaming of a nation uh, that has a future in space. So, and and the, also important to point out that th this was a serious undertaking that was initiated by the DOST. And also the, the then, Field Microsoft program leader had been my mentor as a student and a junior faculty member, uh, who is now the um, first uh, director general of the Philippine Space Agency. And, uh, you know, I was uh, at mid, mid life at that time, so I was really looking for something to accomplish in life. And it so happened that space is really that interesting and it, and it is really worth pursuing. So there are many. Uh, possibilities that uh, that can be pursued in space. So in a uh, space program, uh, the BIRDS program. So I, I came I came to QTech, and uh, so I I was I became part of this program. So the BIRDS program is a cross border international interdisciplinary educa educational educational cubesat project. So it is really for educational purpose. It's not meant to build a satellite that would uh, that would that would be that would that would be hundred percent operational to provide service. It's it's uh, the purpose is to to train students how to build these cube sets, especially those who didn't have uh, any prior experience. So the mission of the program is to develop or advance the indigenous space program. So for the case of the for some countries uh, who didn't have uh, any space program, so this is for them and. For the case of the Philippines, for example, we we, we already we were already having a microsatellite program that, at that time. So our participation in this pro in this program was really to to further our indigenous space activities. And the good thing about CubeSat is they are very small platforms, so they are more cost effective uh, in terms of uh, providing instruction and also as a platform for for research. So this project, our program was hosted by by the by QTech, and uh, each iteration of the project has different participating countries. So for Birds One, we have the following countries: Bangladesh, Ghana, Mongolia, Nigeria, and Japan. And then the Birds Two, which we we which our country participated in, uh, included uh, students from Bhutan, Malaysia, our country, and from Japan. And so the Okay, and then for, for verse three, we have uh, Nepal, uh, Sri Lanka, and Japan. Verse four, uh, we have Paraguay and Philippines participated. But in this case, uh, the participants came from from uh, Mapua University and faculty members from Mapua University and uh, Adamson Adamson University. And then for verse five, which is uh, the new uh, iteration, we have students from uh, Uganda, Zimbabwe, and Japan. So in this program, really the idea is students undergo the overall process of a satellite project cycle in just two years. 
And that includes from mission planning. So determining the what, uh, what mission or what requirements would the satellite uh, would, would the satellite perform? Uh, what desires or which st stakeholders uh, would be served? So that from mission planning and the development to operation. And uh, the, the arrangement is that while doing this hands-on project, they're also doing their master's or doctoral studies. So in BIRDS2 project, so, so this is the team composition. Uh, we had uh, four members from Bhutan and three, uh, two members from Malaysia and two members from the Philippines and three members from Japan. So as you can see in the picture, it's really, uh, it's really a hands-on training. So students get to experience the process in the design, uh, development, uh, integration and testing of the satellite. And then once the satellite is launched, uh, they're, they're also able to operate the satellite through the ground station at the university. And also a good, one good aspect of this project is uh, involvement uh, with various stakeholders in the in the in determining the missions of the satellite and also uh, you know in involving them in the in certain reviews during the project. So basically, the project is uh, is programmed for two years. We built the we designed and built the satellite for one year and three months, and then in March 2018 we finished the flight models. These were hand over, handed over to JAXA, and then uh, it was launched from a rocket in June 2018. And then finally, in August 2018, it was deployed from the ISS through the Japanese Kibo module. And then from that time until November of this year, we, we were, we were uh, operating the satellite and collecting data. And this process of uh, operation really is as as important as the process of developing a satellite. So, because in operating a satellite, we, we, we could learn a lot on how the satellite operates in space, what are the, uh, what, what are the limitations and uh, how we could effectively communicate with, with the satellites. So these are some pictures. Uh, these are the three BIRDS2 satellites. The one on the center is the Maya one. And this is a picture when, uh, I was also part of the team, which uh, delegation, which which carried the the CubeSat to JAXA. And would you imagine that we actually uh, put the satellites on a how to say this suitcase, and then we built, uh, we carried it by hand by Shinkan, and then we rode on on a Shinkansen train, and we carefully carried the satellite to make sure that it it would not be it would not fall or anything. Okay, and these are, are pictures of the deployment from the International Space Station. So the, the satellite, just briefly, so the satellite is a 1U CubeSat. That means it has a dimension of around 10 cm by 10 cm by 10 cm. So it's very small, but it's also compact with uh, a lot of Elect uh, electronics and uh, uh, payload modules that would perform the mission. So uh, the design was inherited from the previous project, Bridge One, and it adopts a uh, backplane interface uh, approach, which was pro originally proposed by a university in Germany. So the idea is that uh, it would be modular. So we have the backplane Black backplane on the bottom, and then we just stack the the boards uh, on the slots. Okay, so you can see in the on the right side is the exploded view. We can see the boards there. You can see the battery, the uh, camera modules, the transceivers. What else? And outside you can see the monopole antennas used for communication. So the missions of the CubeSat are the following. So turn forward mission, uh, APRS Jupiter mission for the amateur uh, community, camera mission to take uh, pictures of the home countries, a GPS mission, uh, mag, uh, me, a mission to measure the magnetic field intensity space and 
another mission to detect the occurrence of single large up event due to uh, high energy particles in space. So the radiation in space could actually disrupt the op operation of the, of the satellite and that has to be mitigated. So I mentioned that uh, in this particular project, uh, it, it is not the conventional or traditional way of building a satellite because it, traditionally you build a large, each, uh, each components and, uh, and even the whole satellite are tested rigorously, but that takes time and also uh, re resources. So with, uh, with, in this project, we uh, adopted a lean satellite approach. That means uh, we take risk. So we take risk, but at the same time, we manage the risk. The idea is so that uh, we can provide the value to the customer at low cost and without taking much time to realize the mission. So this can be achieved by uh, reducing waste and uh, inefficient processes. Uh, actions that, for example, that such as waiting, moving, uh, that can delay the progress. So some examples, so process must be simple. Um, actually, it has been iterated already for for four times now with the project. And then we use commercial off the shelf components. So we don't use the uh, very expensive uh, space, qual space, space qualified components. So we use commercial cost components and we, but we test it so that we make sure that they, are that they would work in space properly. And we leverage on heritage. We make use of the uh, learnings from previous projects. And as you can see, uh, all the activities of the project uh, occurred in just a 30 meter radius. So the office or workroom where students work and then uh, just beside it is a clean room. And then on another, uh, on, on, the, on the first floor, we have the uh, equipment and facility for uh, testing the satellite. And then on another building, we have the ground station. So it's really an efficient way of, of uh, doing a space a satellite project. So from, from now, I'll just show uh, some photos so of our activities. So just to give you an idea uh, how, we, how we did the satellite project. So we have the mission definition reviews, and then wherein we decide the missions based on the uh, desires and, and requirements from the stakeholders, and also considering the constraints in the in the uh, schedule of the satellite, and also the you know the platform is also limited, so those things are considered. And then based on those requirements, we make a design of the satellites uh, at, or a uh, preliminary design, and we also went through a design review to make sure that the satellite that we designed would actually meet the uh, the mission. And then, so we you see there here breadboard model, and then we went to an engineering, engineering model. So breadboard model was pursued so that uh, even with, without completely building the satellite, we will be able to do this. Although it is not, it is not necessary, so because later projects, they skip the breadboard model and went straight to the engineering model. And then the critical design review, the purpose is to review the engineering model to, uh, to review whether it would, uh, after space environment testing and uh, qualification tests, uh, the satellite uh, is ready, okay, the design is ready, and we can make the final version of the satellite. So, and that's where the, uh, after that, that's after the, after that, we build the the three flight models, these are the, the satellites that would be deployed in sent to space. And during this time, the team was uh, divided into country teams or sub teams. So in that case, uh, Philippines, Bhutan and Malaysia, uh, stud Malaysian students had a separate uh, work, like workstation where they assembled and uh, tested the satellite. And as you can see, uh, I've been mentioning about space environment, environment tests. So the space environment tests uh, were done to make sure that the satellite would, would survive in the, in the, during rocket launch and also to 
make sure that the it would survive the extreme temperatures in space. And so also we have some social activities and I skip this part. So basically these are some of the results of the uh, of operation of the satellite from the day zero to until it almost decayed in orbit. So just briefly, so the, some important lessons and insights I learned. So this project uh, gave me a, a taste of the multinational and multicultural space activities, which is really important because uh, in general, space satellite, satellite projects are international efforts. So here we can see, learn, uh, you know, we can also use this as a platform for cultural exchanges. And uh, satellite projects are inherently interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. So uh, engineers have different backgrounds among themselves, but they also have to uh, work with, uh, with people from other backgrounds. So it's important to have both depth and depth of, of your, ex of your uh, knowledge. And then uh, as, as aerospace engineers, it is not enough to be technically adept and logical. You have to have so, uh, soft skills, uh, communication skills, as, as well as you have to be a good team, team player. And in satellite projects, uh, it can be very challenging and it, it uh, expect a lot of uh, surprises. Uh, for example, in, in our project, uh, we didn't expect that even at the flight model, we experienced serious problems, but luckily we were able to solve them. So uh, also space engineers should be able to should be willing to learn and explore new things in order to expand the horizon. So maybe I, I'll just end there. Uh, and then later, if you have uh, questions or comments, you can discuss more, especially about uh, pursuing graduate studies or careers related to space engineering. So thank you for listening. That's my presentation. Thank you, Engineer Salces, for the wonderful talk. And next up uh, will be the second part of our program. Allow me to call on our next guest, one of the developers of Diwata One, Engineer Violan. Engineer Violan. Okay, so allow me to introduce him, sir. So our second speaker recently acquired his Master of Science in Aerospace Engineering degree from Tohoku University, Japan. His research in Tohoku was focused on Diwata 2 target pointing, pointing analysis and calibration. So this includes studying the performance of the attitude determination and control subsystem and its use in coordination with the optical mission payloads of the microsatellite. So this requires conducting in orbit collaboration techniques of the sensors and design in the operation sequence for the high accuracy and precision capture of the satellite's observation images. Before that, he worked on the mechanical design and structural analysis of the Diwata 2 bus system performed vibration and shock tests of the Diwata 2 structure and components ensuring for a successful rocket launch delivery to space. Then he assisted in the satellite's regular operations with the upload of the stored commands. He obtained his bachelor's of science degree in mechanical engineering at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Without further ado, let us give a virtual clap to engineer Edgar Paulo Violan. Okay, uh, thank you for that uh, gracious uh, introduction. Uh, can everybody hear me and see my screen? Not yet, sir. Oh, okay. Uh, mm, po. Oh, okay, sorry, I can't uh, do it again. How about now? Na ba? Po, sir. Okay, all right. Thank you. Again, thank you, uh, Indiana Aerospace University and uh, the hosts for inviting us for this talk and I'm happy along with uh, engineer Salces to 
uh, present our own experience with uh, the country's first satellites now. And uh, again, I, I greet everyone a good afternoon. Maya uh, Hapun Satanan. So I'm here to talk about the Filipino space technology experience, specifically uh, with the Filipino Microsat. So this is Diwata 1 and Diwata 2. Uh, I am Edgar Paolo Villan and I am from the Philippine Space Agency. And a little inform more information about myself. So, uh, as mentioned, I graduated mechanical engineering in UP Diliman, and I'm also a registered mechanical engineer. And then uh, in 2016, I was uh, under the Film Microsoft program. This is a program by the DOFP to build our first satellites. Uh, and then I was sent to Tohoku University uh, for uh, working hands on with the Diwata 2 satellite. Uh, and as well as getting my master's degree in aerospace engineering. So earlier this year, fortunately, I graduated and I was blessed to have a position with our new Philippine Space Agency. So I think my experience is similar to what uh, Engineer Salces has experienced. Uh, in his case, he was sent to Kyushu Institute of Technology to work on nanosatellites or CubeSats. I was then sent to uh, Tohoku University uh, to uh, to work with the, the relatively larger uh, microsatellite. So this is uh, the Diwata microsatellites. Uh, Diwata 1, uh, as mentioned earlier, was uh, our first, the first ever Filipino-made uh, satellite. Uh, it was launched 2016 uh, at an orbit uh, around 420 kilometers ab above the Earth. Uh, and it, it was actually decommissioned earlier this year when its orbit decayed. And its successor, Diwata 2, uh, was launched uh, two years later uh, at a higher orbit for, of around 600 kilometers altitude. So uh, these are called microsatellites as opposed to the conventional large satellites that we see, and as opposed to the smaller cube satellites that uh, Engineer Salsas presented earlier. So uh, they have around uh, 50 kilograms in weight. And they uh, they have dimensions of around 55 by 55 by 55 centimeters. So it's collab a collaboration with Philippine and Japanese institutions. In this case, it's the Hoku University, Hokkaido University, the DOST, and University of the Philippines. And it's an Earth observation satellite. And it is the, its mission is to gather remote sensing data through imaging areas of interests. So uh, maybe uh, some of Philip. Our fellow Filipinos may ask, uh, I think our host also mentioned this earlier, there, is, uh, there may be a pushback with uh, space technology here in the Philippines because as we know, space technology is expensive. And uh, here we have the government funding uh, satellites, funding our new space agency that is uh, paid for by the taxpayer. So why did we invest uh, in this kind of technology and why did we create th this satellites? So, of course, we want to build these satellites for the benefit of the, of the country. And as we all know, Philippine, the Philippines is abundant in natural resources. But unfortunately, we also know that we are prone to natural calamities and disasters, as we may have experienced recently. We are the fourth most disaster-prone country. We have 20 typhoons a year. We, also have, we are also in the Pacific Ring of Fire. So we hope that by having our eyes in the sky, we can raise our own situation awareness with our country and gather remote sensing data. So just a quick example here. Uh, here uh, is, of course, a satellite image taken by a Japanese weather satellite, Noari. And superimposed here is our own satellite image taken by our own satellite, Iwata 2. And uh, as this satellite project is, uh, was funded by the DOST, uh, Microsoft, so Microsoft succeeded by the Stamina for Space program. Uh, and part of the scope of the satellite project is to develop Filipino expertise in space science technology and applications. Here we see the Diwata 1 team uh, with uh, Diwata 1 Filipino engineers. And here we see my team, or uh, the team that I was a part of, the Diwata 2 team, uh, uh, develop our own satellite. And its goal is to address the needs in scientific earth observation of the Philippines. So just quick examples, uh, because of the water one and the water two, we were able to monitor uh, Manila Bay and the pollution. Uh, we also monitored the Taal volcano eruption. And as mentioned earlier, we also monitored uh, typhoons from space. So actually this is, I think, 
uh, Tyson of Ulysses uh, that was that devastated us that. So how did we build our satellites specifically? Uh, Tokyo University helped with the bus development. This is the uh, structure of uh, the satellite assembly and uh, Hokkaido with the payload development. In this case, the payloads are optical cameras. And of course, we also started investing in the Philippines by building a ground receiving station with the DOST and uh, having our data processing, processing capabilities with the University of the Philippines and other institutions. And with this uh, satellite development, I would then like to share and narrate my own personal experience with doing satellite research and development in Japan. Uh, maybe just a disclaimer here. I think uh, I might be preaching to the choir right now being uh, you guys, our audience, our young aerospace and aeronautical engineers. Uh, I must first admit that prior to my experience with the Duwata 2 satellite, uh, I had no uh, background in dealing with aerospace engineering, uh, much more with space or much more with satellites. Uh, for one reason or the other, my undergrad uh, in mechanical engineering didn't focus on much on space and satellites. And in a sense, I kind of envy you know, uh, that you can learn more about aerospace while you are still young, you are still uh, in your undergrad. But anyway, I will uh, do my best to share with you and uh, and narrate my experiences in, to in Tohoku University and in my laboratory. So, of course, I was blessed to have an opportunity to, ha uh, with, to have a scholarship uh, that was granted by the DOSD to Tohoku University. It is located in Sendai City, just north of Japan. And in my university, we have uh, research groups, and I, I belong to the Space Robotics Laboratory. So uh, they also have uh, researches, research fields in robotics with space application. And of course, they, had, they have their own satellite research and development team. As you can see here, these are all the satellites uh, produced by the lab. So as early as 2000, so like 10 years ago, they were able to produce uh, their own satellites from their own university. So as, as early as 2009, graduate and undergraduate students were able to experience that uh, satellite development. And here we see Diwata 1 and Diwata 2 in their lineup. And then uh, for the Diwata 2 development, as the usual first steps for an in, in engineering project, it starts with design. Here we learn satellite design and assembly. We follow the usual design process. We make uh, CAD drawings. We make uh, we make uh, engineering drawings, we talk to the manufacturers, we fabricate them, we check the product, inspect, integrate, and then assemble. So you see here, this is uh, me and my team, uh, my fellow Filipino engineers that were that were building uh, Diwata 2. So just a note here, even before the pandemic, uh, we, we were already in our PPEs, but uh, this is... Uh, just to minimize contamination from dust and foreign, so other foreign substance uh, to the satellite. And we also learned how to do structural analysis. Uh, this is a part of the satellite design pro process. So uh, although space is a microgravity environment, the problem is during the rocket launch. So as uh, currently we, oh, we have only one way to send uh, stops the space and that is by rocket launches and it, and rocket launches are a rough ride uh, we must design the satellite structure that it could withstand uh, the vibrations uh, 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 vibrations during this uh, launch and so we do this by using a technique called finite element analysis and we try to find the weak points of the system and how it uh, uh, and predict how it responds to vibrations but doing analysis is not enough we have to do sat uh, actual satellite vibration testing. So I'm flashing a video. I, I hope you can see here. Here's the Wata 2, the actual flight model of the Wata 2 uh, in a shaker table. So we put the actual satellite here and we input the uh, vibration levels. Uh, vibration levels, we also uh, attach uh, sensors or accelerometers to see uh, and to check what is going on what is going on with the satellite. So this is a very important uh, test uh, as uh, not only if, as if we fail this test, not only uh, the satellite might be damaged or destroyed, we can also uh, be liable if, uh, or we might also affect uh, the rocket launch itself. So if some component fell off, it might affect 
uh, the other payloads in the rocket that might affect the rocket. And that is something that we do not want. That is something the rocket launchers do not want. So actually the rocket launchers want to have the vibration test results. And if we fail, we do not even get to go inside a rocket. So as, as uh, after rocket launch, when it is released into space, uh, uh, as we all know, space is a hostile environment. It can be very, very hot or very cold. Uh, we also try to test uh, our satellites using a thermal vacuum test. So we put the satellite inside the, the thermal vacuum chamber. The air is evacuated and we have, uh, uh, we have uh, coolants and we have heaters that will simulate the temperature ranges. So we must ensure that the satellite will still be functioning under these conditions. So uh, another aspect I can share is designing deployable mechanisms. Uh, here uh, we see that the WATA2 has a deployable antenna shown here, there we go. And it also has deployable solar panels. So a common feature in spacecrafts or in satellites is they have deployables because uh, rocket launchers uh, have a certain a form factor limit that they could accept in their rockets. And we, we design deployable, deployable mechanisms so that once our satellites are released to space, uh, we can uh, access, we can maximize, for example, uh, for deployable panels, we can maximize power generation uh, with uh, deployable solar panels. And another, a, a unique challenge here is that we cannot see that we cannot see actual the actual deployment in space unless you have a camera. But even if you have a camera, uh, if the deployment if we know that deployment fails, uh, we can only do so much in the ground. And of course, it is also subject to the same vibration and temperature uh, environments and limitations that we have. And so this is aerospace and satellite engineering uh, in a nutshell. Uh, everything is checked tested and accounted for while the satellite is still on the ground because once, it did once the satellite is launched, it is almost impossible to fix in space unless you're like NASA that have lots of money to send their astronauts to fix their own satellite. So I think this is uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. So I'm just sharing you here uh, images of the release of the WATA-1 from the International Space Station. And then here uh, you can see a time-lapse video of, my, of our team uh, uh, doing, uh, assembling the Diwata 2. So here you can see uh, the scale of the satellite uh, compared to, uh, to uh, the smaller, the bigger satellites. And uh, of course, while uh, this, is, this was designed uh, by, this was designed under supervision with Japanese professors and experts, uh, we can probably say that Diwata 1, Diwata 2, and even Maya 1 are Filipino-made satellite. So it is indeed a Filipino achievement and it's something worth celebrating about. So maybe I'll share you after launch, how did it work? So as the satellite orbits in space, it can point, we can adjust the attitude so that it can point to a specific area. So example here, as it runs to Palawan, we can have th these images and have this area to be covered. And then uh, the work doesn't finish finish there. So my work doesn't finish when the satellite is launched. We, I was involved al also in satellite operation. So here we uh, we, sign, uh, we predict the ground track of the satellite and identify the possible target location that we want to take a picture. We set the required attitude. We set the required camera specification and we send the commands to the satellite and the satellite will execute it. And we download the satellite uh, through our ground receiving stations. And then we can have uh, data products uh, with post analysis of the images. <clears throat> so I'm just sharing uh, my research uh, in my research and experimenting with Diwata 2, specifically specifically about its attitude con determination and control uh, for Earth observation missions. So with this uh, mission, I was able to to do experiments uh, it, and when taking pictures all over the world. So example here. Here is uh, this mission was in Dubai, and this mission was in Suez Gulf with uh, with uh, many cameras that uh, that the Wata to have. So this was also another mission in Greece. And another cool thing about my research that I, I am I think proud of, I was also able to capture the moon uh, with 
as part of the calibration procedure that uh, my research had. So you can see the craters and all. So uh, that's satellite research and engineering. I've, uh, again, I, I, as mentioned earlier, before going there, I didn't have any background with sat satellites. So I learned that it's a multidisciplinary field. It has mechanical engineering, electric, electronic, geodetic, physics aspect. Uh, it's challenging in a sense that I have to learn so much uh, to have that learning curve. Uh, but And it's also intimidating to operate a flying computer worth millions of taxpayers' money. So I, I actually needed to make, uh, to make sure that my experiments and uh, the stuff we, uh, that we do during satellite development does not destroy the satellite. Uh, but it is, I can say from personal experience, it's fulfilling, especially uh, when you see the results of your research, when you see the results of the satellite images taken. And other personal insights that I can share uh, with my experience in Japan, they have a large amount of graduate studies. I think uh, engineer Salsas also mentioned this earlier. Uh, there are also lots of foreign students. That's a very unique uh, feature if, if you're gonna go schooling abroad. Uh, they have good research support. Uh, they have past procurement, something uh, I think the Philippines needs. They have a good mentorship culture. Uh, of course, we know from anime senseis and senpais, uh, we actually use that in Japan. So I call my professor Hamoto sensei. And maybe one last thing about the uh, insight that I learned is uh, unfortunately here, or at least my experience before, we have that Okinawan mentality where we do the bare minimum. Uh, that wouldn't do it there in Japan, do it best or do it again. And of course that wouldn't do in the areas in satellite where uh, the risks are high. Um, parting thoughts, uh, research is exciting, space is exciting. I think you might already know this being young aerospace engineers. Uh, going into space technology is a value invest viable investment for any emerging nation. And just like uh, Engineer Salsa said, said earlier, I urge you to look for scholarships. So I urge you to continue uh, in your education with uh, aerospace engineering, maybe be part of uh, our future space industry, maybe go into the academe. We need more uh, experts in aerospace field. We need more experts in the space engineering field. Uh, we, uh, and uh, I also urge you to support our scientists and researchers. So I, I'm thank you, thankful for uh, Indiana Aerospace University for this avenue you know, that we can uh, share our experience for the, from in Philippine Space Agency and Stamina for Space. Uh, I hope you continue supporting our researchers and scientists. And for the young people out there, bet, better be one in the future. And I leave you with this uh, picture uh, where this is a Diwata 2 satellite component. We scribbled our names here uh, as a celebratory moment uh, just before we closed the satellite and sent it to space. We scribbled our names, our handwriting there. Uh, maybe we want to have these, uh, more of these in the future. So maybe in the future, uh, some of our students will have their own handwriting in space. And maybe, uh, I don't know, we don't know, maybe some of you can be our, the first Filipino astronaut. So again, uh, thank you very much, Daghan Salamat, for this talk. You can follow the Philippine Space Agency and the Stamina for Space Project uh, in the major social media. And you can also reach us in these uh, contact details. So again, thank you very much, and Daghan Salamat. Thank you, Engineer Violan. And a while ago, thank you also, Engineer Sanchez. Thank you for that intimate look into the design and uh, not just the design, the whole journey into bringing those microsatellites into fruition um, with our first nanosatellite, Maya 1, and for our first microsatellite, Diwata 1 and Diwata 2. So for next up, allow me to call on our Dean of Colleges, Dr. Donita Legaspi, as she welcomes our guest of honor. Um, Dean. Um, Dean. Hi, Mom Dean. Good afternoon. Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we are very much honored and privileged to have with us our third guest speaker, who is an expert in electrical and electronics engineering. His knowledge in his field of specialization 
is par excellence. He is a professor of electrical and electronics engineering at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. And in January 2020, he was appointed as the first director general of the Philippine Space Agency, where he is now leading the build up and mobilization of the newly created National Government Agency. Immediately prior to this Philippine Space Agency, he served as the acting director of the Advanced Science Technology Institute of the Department of Science and Technology. He obtained his BS Electrical Engineering from UP Diliman and his doctorate in philosophy in Electrical Engineering and Telecommunications from the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. He was a JSPS Fellow at the Tokyo Institute of Technology, Japan in 2003, the UP Dado Banatao Postdoctoral Fellow at the Berkeley Wireless Research Center in the University of California, Berkeley, and at the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of California, San Diego, in 2004 and in 2005, respectively. In 2007 and 2008, he was a visiting associate research scientist in UCSD from 2013 to 2016, and he served as the interim director of the Institute for Information Infrastructure Development of the Philippines, California Advanced Research Institutes under the Philippine Commission on Higher Education. He held the Dado and Maria Banatao Professorial Chair at the UP College of Engineering from 2010 and 2016, when he was seconded to the DOST ASTI. He has over 25 years of experience leading and managing research and development and technical operations in specialized areas of wireless communications, both software defined and cognitive radio technology, RFID, MIMO, etc radio frequency spectrum management and policy, rural connectivity, emergency response communications, sensor networks and scientific earth observation microsatellites. As the program leader of the Philippine Microsat and Stamina for a space programs from 2014 to 2020, he led a diverse team in the development and utilization of the country's first scientific earth observation microsatellites, the Wata 1 and the Wata 2, the nano satellite Maya 1, and at least 10 more small satellites in various stages of development. These initiatives include associated activities in ground station and mission control operations, data archiving and distribution remote sensing and artificial intelligence on geospatial data, academic program development, and the establishment of local research and testing facilities in small satellites and local industry engagement in space technology. Our speaker is a senior member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, a member of the Institute of Electronics Information and Communications Engineers of Japan and the ASEAN Engineers. He has received several recognitions for his teaching research and public service, including the following, the Gawad Chancellor, para sa Nalalanging Goro or Chancellor's Award for being the outstanding teacher in UP Diliman, the most outstanding electronics engineer in the field of education from the Institute of Electronics Engineers of the Philippines, one of the 100 outstanding alumni engineers from the UP Alumni Engineers, the 2015 Manila Water Foundation Prize for Engineering Excellence, the 2017 
Distinguished Alumni Award in Science and Technology from the University of the Philippines Alumni Association and 2018 finalist in the Dangal ng Bayan Awards of the Civil Service Commission. Ladies and gentlemen, I have given you the highlights of his life. With great pride and pleasure, please help me welcome the Director General of the Philippine Space Agency, Dr. Joel Joseph S. Marciano, Jr. Thank you very much, Dean Dr. Legaspi, for the kind introduction. And may thank I also you, thank you for, yes, may I also greet uh, Mr. Harold Toring, the CEO, and Dr. Hovenal Toring, the president, Indiana Aerospace University. I'm truly honored um, to be part of this event. Um, maybe I should uh, start by saying that, you know, I might be the um, um, Gen um, DG now of Ilsa, but I'm still a professor. I am on secondment from UP to the Filsa, and I do miss teaching, and I relish every opportunity to be in front of students and faculty members. So good afternoon, everyone. Maayong hapon. Um, and to the faculty members, uh, school officials, but certainly the students, uh, thank you for this opportunity. I will now share my screen so we can get started on uh, my presentation okay, on the Filsa. The title is A Nation Bridged, Uplifted, and Empowered Through Space, Value Creation in Space Through Data, Industry, and People. Okay. So let me start rather unconventionally by talking about computers. Um, and this is the changing face of computing. This is a very old picture, as you can see. It's a computer room filled with uh, PCs and personal computers. And you can see the CRT monitors. We don't have them anymore. We have flat screens now. But this is some, a picture we're accustomed to of computers. Um, in, with the advent of the internet, we started putting computers and accessing computers in faraway places, in remote places called um, server farms, data centers. So you see here a picture of a rack, a racks and racks of computers that are someplace. We don't really know where. Uh, we just refer to it as the cloud. And then when we um, do our computing, we actually don't know that we are connecting to remote computers or to the cloud. When we do computing, we tend to think of fancy simulations like uh, numerical modeling, um, you know, all these um, algorithms. Um, that's still true. That's still computing, right? But uh, recently, of course, computing has become more demo democratized, more part participatory. When we update our Facebook status, when we send out a tweet, when we do a Google search, we are computing. It's no longer confined to the realm of the fancy numerical modeling. Um, everyone who accesses uh, internet and types a query into a web browser or a search engine triggers a chain of computation. So this is called social computing. Computers themselves are changing. You know, they fit now. They're no longer the dull, boring, gray, black boxes on our desks, on, on our laps. Um, the computers are becoming smaller, fit in the palm of our hands. They're becoming more embedded in the environment. So we're entering, or we are in this era called ubiquitous computing, whereas uh, we came from an era of uh, mainframes the paradigm where you had one computer serving many people, primarily because computers then were so esoteric, uh, they were expensive, bulky, uh, they filled up an entire floor of one building. Um, that was the mainframe era that has since uh, in a way gone away, um, then entered the personal computing era here, PCs, oops, with PCs, wherein the paradigm is now one person, one computer, that's why, hence you know, personal computers, because computers became affordable. Um, this is the era of Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and, and all of those guys who put computers in our homes and our offices. Now we're entering the ubiquitous computing, uh, computing era, or we have entered that era wherein 
the reality is one person having access to many computers. Um, many computers, what are we talking about? We're talking about our cell phones, are talking about our laptops, desktops, or even our watches. And soon computers will be in our clothes, in our wallets. It will be on grocery carts. When you go into a shopping uh, supermarket and you put an item in the shelf and there's a computer, uh, there is a sensor on the shelf that detects the items that you're taking. And it detects, if it detects that if the, you took out the last item in that shelf, it will send a signal to the warehouse to replenish the, the shelf. So think about that. The mere act of picking up a grocery item triggers a chain of computations, triggers a chain of computing, right? And so somebody famously said that in 2020, uh, in the 2025, 2030s, in a course of a 24 hour period, we would be interfacing with an average of 10,000 computers in a single day. So if we continue thinking about computers as those laptops and desktops, we can never imagine such a scenario, but if we could see computers as being embedded in the environment or becoming invisible infrastructure, then it's easier to imagine that. So computers are going the way of the light bulb. Uh, in the beginning, they were exclusive technology like electricity, but now you go someplace and there's no electricity, you complain and you tend to think this place is rather backward. Uh, why, is it, why is there no electricity here? Um, but with computers, it's also vanishing technology. You, can you think of other technologies that are vanishing now? What does that mean by when you say vanishing? They are increasingly becoming, are being taken for granted because we assume that it's there, right? And that's just like electricity, we assume it's in almost every home. So we complain if there's no outlet. Think about the next time you go to a coffee shop and there's no Wi-Fi, or if you have to pay for Wi-Fi. Um, isn't it that we tend to complain and tell our friends, why did we choose to meet here when the Wi-Fi is not free? Because we assume that Wi-Fi is now part of the invisible infrastructure in the background that we, we are entitled to and we have access to. So computers are changing. Not only are they changing, but they're vanishing. Right? So they're going the way of the light bulb. So, which brings me to one of my favorite quote from Mark Weiser, the so-called father of ubiquitous computing who said that the most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it. So my, my next question now would be, where else do we think computers are vanishing into? My answer to that is space. So this is, you've probably seen it, uh, our satellite, uh, microsatellite, the Wata one being deployed from the International Space Station into low Earth orbit. Um, we might think of the Wata one as a satellite, but we think of it as a computer. Because after all, if you look inside that Balikbayan box sized uh, satellite, you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, at least seven computers um, that controls things like its orientation or attitude control, um, the payloads, science handling unit, the power supply systems, the charging of the solar panels and the batteries, uh, the charging of the batteries through the solar panels, the one uh, computer that controls the radio uh, and the main processing unit that handles, orchestrates everything. So it's a bunch of computers inside that satellite. So engineers now, so the future is becoming smaller, um, apologies. The future now is becoming smaller. You see here our satellites um, as, as, as microsatellites are becoming uh, smaller. And that is because engineers are taking the best of what's on earth, the components and electronics and systems that power our cell phones and are putting them into orbit to build these satellites. So it's kind of a reverse trend. We're in now uh, commodities on earth uh, again, uh, things that build up our cell phones and computers are now being repurposed and tested in a space environment so that we can see whether they will work in a space environment. And consequently, by doing that, we can build satellites that are cheaper, faster, uh, we can build them faster. And also with the advent of more uh, commercialization of rocket launches, we can have increasing access to space. So all of those are combining so that countries like the Philippines are now in a position for, uh, to access space uh, more readily. You can see that with our Diwata-1 launch and with the launch of the Maya-1 Maya CubeSats together with uh, Bhutan and Malaysia, uh, these nanosatellites were deployed in 2018. Okay. 
So do we say now that the Philippines is building and deploying satellites? Uh, I'd like to say that what we're doing is we're put, putting computers in orbit. So everyone is familiar with the computer. We depend on computers and we take them for granted actually. Um, and they're becoming increasingly embedded in the environment. They're finding their way into space. So having a computer in space means that we have a powerful um, engine that has a strategic vantage point from which it can gather data from our, about our environment, sense our environment, take pictures, um, relay signals and uh, enable communication. So just as computers improve our lives on earth, by putting them in space, they can do a lot more. So the question here is, why are we putting computers in orbit? So what for? Well, the answer, one answer is data. You've seen CAPS and Adrian show, you know, our satellites taking pictures. So this data comes in the form of satellite images and earth observation um, currently. So this is data that leads to scientific discovery and a better understanding of our environment. Data that helps evidence-based policies for more relevant and responsive programs. Data as fuel for a knowledge-based economy and the new industrial revolution. And data that helps tackle information poverty that fosters in inclusive innovation. So we talk about data mobilization therefore. When we build and launch our earth observation satellites, we talk about mobilizing data. So here's an example. When a typhoon is reported to be entering the Philippine area of responsibility, just like Typhoon Mangkut in 2017, our country immediately mobilizes capability in data in the form of archived satellite images. So if this is the track of the typhoon, then we immediately mobilize satellite images over those areas that might be affected by the typhoon. In that sense, you get a pre-disaster image or pre-typhoon image. So after the typhoon passes, then you mobilize your satellites again to take pictures over the affected areas. So now you have a post-disaster, post-typhoon image and a pre-disaster image. And what do you do? You do the change detection. You measure changes between pre and post. And you don't do that by eyeballing images. You do that with so-called machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms that run on high-performance computers. So over the past few years, our country has invested in this capability precisely because we are frequently visited by typhoons, by all sorts of uh, natural disasters and calamities. So by utilizing space, we can prepare ourselves better and respond better to these situations. So among the things that you can derive by looking at these pre and post disaster images is a, air, is a pro probable flooded area map shown here in the bottom right where you see those blue streaks those are areas where you see water where there was none before. So most likely that is where the flooding is and you immediately mobilize this data and send it to relevant groups such as the National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Council or NDRMC and the Office of Civil Defense. You send it to the Department of Agriculture so that they can assess agricultural damage. These are things that our country needs and that's what we look to space for. So in the case of data mobilization for Typhoon Mangkut, we mobilized around eight terabytes of data for that entire typhoon. And you know, the larger the typhoon, the more amount of data you, can, you need to mobilize. So in some sense, we can use the amount of data as a proxy, as a, as a category for the size of the typhoon as well. Now, the larger the scope of this typhoon, the more data we have to mobilize. So that in a way translates our capability to the plane of of, of, of data, of, um, of uh, uh, computing infrastructure, that we are preparing ourselves smarter and better for these, um, for these events. Okay. Other examples of mobilizing space data. Here we have Diwata. This is a picture of the Diwata satellite over Manila Bay. So you see here in the middle picture, a processed image of the one on the left where you have uh, a false color image showing turbidity of water turbidity and murkiness of water. And you can see there a bit in the north and near the Bulacan area and then the mouth of the Pasig River there, um, I guess some effluents. And I guess the, the, the usefulness of an image like this is when, when our government launches a cleanup drive, then you have a baseline image. And then after that effort, perhaps you can measure it again. So the beautiful thing is you can do this after some time and see where there are improvements and see where there are changes. 
So you see on the right, we took the same image a year, almost uh, more than a year later. This was February 2018. This is June 2019. And you can see whether such efforts have been effective or whether things are due to seasonal variations uh, in, in the environment. But in any case, now you have a capability for, for making these measurements from a very strategic vantage point over large geographical scales and at regular time intervals. That's the value of space for us. In the case of a, this is in Naga Cebu, um, the landslide that occurred there. So the moment the team uh, learned about the landslide, they immediately mobilized satellite images again. So shown here on the left is a estimated area of the landslide from an archived image. Um, we already know the landslide occurred, but we needed to mobilize uh, data right away. So this is the image that we have. And then based on media reports, the blue area is the extent of the landslide. But the value that we created on this image is when we overlaid the building footprints in this map. You see those red rectangles, those are a building footprints that were estimated by machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms that have been trained to detect houses. So the value of this image is you can see immediately the blue, air, the blue perimeter where it encompasses those building footprints. And that is most likely where the affected households are by the landslide, right? And the moment we are able to get a satellite image over the area showing the actual landslide, then we send this image out again right, to emergency responders on the field. And in this case, it shows a rather close agreement between our initial estimates and this actual uh, view of the landslide. Again, showing where the buildings are and showing the extent of the landslide. So the value of an image like this in the hands of an emergency responder is that they will have more actionable, intelligent information on where to try to look for survivors first. Okay, so this is... Um, Again, a capability that our country has been building up and we will continue to expand under the Philippine Space Agency. Okay. So here are some pictures from various posts on Facebook of emergency responders actually seeing these maps, or we see in these images our maps being used in the field. So there is nothing more gratifying to a scientist and engineer than to have their work in the laboratories um, being translated into real world use. And as in, in this case, uh, in an attempt to try to save lives and property. Right? So this is a case of an end-to-end -end where we in our investments in space to our satellites and the ground investments on, on um, receiving stations, high performance computers, algorithms, data science, remote sensing, uh, all came together to produce this map, which is put in the hands of the emergency responders has been used to um, try to save lives. So we also use um, data from space to measure other things like econometric or uh, the state of our economy or maybe the impact of typhoons. Um, so for example, um, there are satellites that take images at night and by doing so they measure night lights. So it's shown there in the bottom left is an image of our country, an actual satellite image at night showing where the night lights are. And I guess night lights is a proxy for electrification. So you know where the population lives and you know if you know where the night lights are, then I guess you can measure how much of the population has access to electricity, right? Electrification is visible from space. There is a satellite called DEERS, Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite that measures these night lights. So what did we do with the data from the satellite? During, uh, in Tacloban, during Haiyan or Yolanda, when the typhoon struck, obviously all the lights went out. So the light, night lights went up. And then what we noticed is you know, after the typhoon passed, because we're seeing our path to recovery the night, in terms of the night lights being restored. Right? But every time a new typhoon comes, we are kind of set back a little bit. The night lights go down, we bounce back. The night lights go down after another typhoon and we bounce back. And then we can see whether we more or less restored it to the previous pre-typhoon, pre-Yolanda levels. An interesting exercise here would be to compare across different kinds of disasters, how fast we're able to recover from the impact of these disasters. In this case, interestingly, in a peculiar way by measuring electricity or night lights. Okay. So these are things that satellite images now can provide us and which you can infer. We also use night lights to estimate household income or expenditure. 
be correlated against the census. So the premise here is that uh, having access to electricity means also purchasing power, right? So you see here a correlation between night lights, measuring night lights and household income, and we're seeing a good correlation. And this will be presented to the Census Bureau. And the Census Bureau is now also looking increasingly at the use of satellite images to conduct measurements of our economy and the census. Okay. So it's not just about the data, it's also about developing a local space industrial base. As, as shown by my colleagues, uh, Caps and Adrian, they worked on these modules. No? These are examples of electronics and systems that have since been put on our satellites and have gained space heritage because they worked. So an amateur ham radio payload, an attitude experimental attitude control unit. Attitude controls mean it, it controls the orientation of the satellite, the pointing of the cameras, and a sensor uh, that measures, uh, looks for the sun, a uh, sun aspect sensor. So by building these electronics in our laboratories, we can cascade them to local industry, therefore opening opportunities for local companies in the manufacturing and supply chain globally. globally. So when we build products for satellites, Essentially, what we're doing is we're building products for a difficult environment. That means these components have to be high reliability. And if we're able to build high reliability systems and products, we have a competitive edge as a country, right? That means the barrier to entry is higher because we have mastered, we, we also have mastered more difficult technologies and that could help uh, propel our economy forward by differentiating these uh, capabilities um, in, in the global stage. Okay. So since then, we have been attempting to quote unquote localize some satellite modules by engaging local companies. That is a logical next step after we, after we build our own satellites is to now explore, can we increase the local content in the satellite by putting in our own components, uh, things that are supplied or manufactured locally or, or own materials, etc. So this is this just shows a whole roadmap of satellites that we are planning on showing different tiers. You know? at, the, at the bottom tier, we have our one kilogram nano satellite, which is really our platform for education and technology proliferation. This is opened up. That means it's accessible by anyone in the Philippines to our university program. And pretty soon we will be, we hope to also um, bring this to the high schools so that the building of the one unit nano satellites will, will be a high school project. Uh, on top of that, we have our 50 kilogram platforms, the Diwata series, Diwata 1, Diwata 2, and work on Diwata 3 now is uh, starting. Uh, so this is our platform for scientific and ex scientific um, experimentation. Then we have our application specific and operational quality satellites weighing between 100 to 300 kilograms, starting with the MULA multispectral satellite. MULA is Ilocano for land or lupa, and it studies agriculture and food security. That's the intent. So uh, a, a proposed series of satellites dealing with infrared, video imaging, and microwave for precipitation is also, in plan, also being planned. And finally, up there, we have the larger satellites where we resort to mission partnerships with other countries. Already for the Novasar satellite, this is a synthetic aperture radar satellite. We are a partner with India, Australia, and the UK. So four countries, Philippines, UK, Australia, and India, on, on, this, um, on the mission of this satellite, which is for maritime domain awareness and measuring um, uh, counting ships and detecting ships. Okay. So when we build these satellites, we build people and a knowledge workforce. So as I mentioned, we have opened up a CubeSat development program in the university. Um, so there's already a second batch of scholars and uh, shown there with this Adrian there building uh, Maya, Maya One. This is the first batch of scholars. We have built a laboratory wherein we conduct all of these um, activities. And um, again, hopefully we can soon proliferate this to more universities with the support of PILSA. So just to show you some activities of these scholars, no? we, they do a mission design workshop um, and then they start the, building the CubeSats and uh, with the local facilities, uh, some, you can do some of those testing like in this uh, full anechoic chamber. Um, of course, you have to build your printed circuit boards and you have to assemble them and then um, you work as a team um, to, to build different components of it and put it together. So it's not something that it, individual work and then you just converge later on. No, it's a series of tight in interaction between different uh, team members working on different parts uh, so that they have empathy for each other's concerns until they build a functional whole. 
Okay, so some more pictures of the team. And imagine yourself now, take out one of the guys in the picture, imagine yourself in the picture. And um, believe me, that is becoming more accessible to, to us in the Philippines. And we hope to expand this, as I said, not just to universities, but also to high schools. Okay. And of course, you have to test your satellites in this uh, in facility. So we also have to um, resort to facilities of our partners overseas in the meantime that we're still building our own or if we might choose to build or we might not. It's also a platform for international cooperation. So finally, um, we talk about when we build satellites, we're building a certain kind of people, call them T-shaped people. So T-shaped people, the T is a metaphor. That means if you're T-shaped, you have a depth of expertise. If you're a mechanical engineer, if you are a civil engineer, you're very good at that. That's your depth of expertise. That's the vertical. But then you can also work with others. You have a breadth of knowledge. That's the horizontal bar, right? And the, the horizontal bar is the breadth of skills and the ability to collaborate across disciplines with experts in other areas. So it, in order to be T-shaped, you need to have empathy. That means you need, as an engineer and as a scientist, you need to understand what the concern is of the other engineers and scientists, because what you're doing and what they are doing has to come together in order to build the entire system. If you do not talk to each other, if you do not have empathy, if everybody designs on their own, then when you start putting things together, it will not work, or it will take more time. It will you'll be over budget, and you'll end up with a satellite that's delayed, that's over budget, and that nobody will use because the people were not properly coordinated in building it. Okay. So we need T-shaped people and institutions in order to create innovations. And by building satellites, we are breeding these kinds of engineers and scientists and administrators as well. Okay, so these are so far examples of uh, uh, people that uh, have gone through this program and have uh, put their hands on satellites. We want them to uh, multiply, going to multiply this. But I show this picture as well as they're holding up their diplomas. They're holding up their master's and PhD degrees diplomas. No? So I encourage everyone here, um, you know, you go to university after you get your bachelor's, consider doing your master's and even your doctorate degrees because it is not something that is so far-fetched. For our country to be at the edge of knowledge, we need to do this heavy R&D as well. And we need to be in order to be at the edge of knowledge, we need to uh, undergo these programs in a systematic way by doing a master's and PhD. It brings us to the front lines. It brings us to the edge of knowledge. And now we can compete globally. Okay. And certainly space technology is at the frontier. So for us to be at the frontier, I encourage all of you to explore doing your advanced degrees as well, just as your fellow Filipinos here in the picture have. Okay, and finally, uh, all of these things that you've seen culminated in this, uh, the challenge culminated in the formation of the Philippine Space Agency by virtue of Republic Act 11363, uh, August last year. Um, it gave the FILSA the mandate to be the primary policy planning, coordinating, implementing administrative entity of the executive branch of government that will plan, develop, and promote the national space program. And in that uh, space policy, there are six key development areas, national security and development, hazard management and climate studies, space R&D, space industry capacity building, education and awareness and international cooperation. So the challenge for the FILSA is to build on top of what's already there and to retain people like Caps and Adrian who was talking here before me and challenge them some more to build even greater things for the country in space. And you of course are all invited to participate in that as we build our space ecosystem in the Philippines. So let me end by sharing with you our mission and vision. The FILSA envisions a Filipino nation bridged, uplifted, and empowered through the peaceful uses of outer space. And our mission is to promote and sustain a robust Philippine space ecosystem that adds and creates value in space for and from Filipinos and for the world. Dagang salama, thank you very much from the Philippine Space Agency. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Joel Marciano. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Um, it, it, I, I'm pretty sure I'm not alone in this when I say that um, space, really the, the study of space seemed so far-fetched before this talk and after this talk. I think um, safe to say that uh, it, it just got nearer to everyone here. So for 
at this point, we're going to um, start our panel discussion. So we'll have a few questions. Um, we don't have much time. So we'll have a few questions by the students. So in connection to the final part, which in which uh, Dr. Marciano mentioned that uh, one way for the students to prepare themselves for a career in space is to take up their master's and doctoral degree. Um, doctor, what step, I, I'd like to address this question. So this is from our students. I'd like to address this question to our three panels, uh, to engineer Paolo, engineer Adrian, and to Dr. Joel Marciano. Um, what skills, how can our students, so, for majority of our participants, uh, it seems like the space industry is very far-fetched. It's um, something that they just see in YouTube and TV. So with your presentation, it can be done. Your you, you are all evidence of, of what are the possibilities that uh, are out there and what can be done to in order to achieve those possibilities. So the question is, uh, what can our students do to prepare themselves to be um, to elevate themselves for the industry to be prepared for the industry uh, what steps can they take uh, what are the soft and hard skills that they need to train themselves in so that they will be prepared for the industry we all know that uh, it's at the forefront and with the pandemic, with uh, the state of uh, Philippine education. We know that the UP is at the forefront in our country, but um, for the most part, we are still lacking. So again, the question is simply, what can our students do? How can they prepare themselves? Caps, so, you wanna go ahead or Adrian? Go ahead, please, yeah. Uh, Yes, sir. Uh, I, I can answer that and maybe draw from my own experience. So I think I mentioned before uh, when I was in undergrad, I didn't have that. Uh, I actually didn't think that I would be able to be involved in a satellite project since you know, well, uh, there was no, I thought there was no opportunities for Filipinos. But now uh, we have uh, these achievement, achievements from Diwata 1, Diwata 2. And as presented earlier, we are trying to build up uh, the, that Filipino pool of expertise. Uh, we are trying to uh, bring what we learn abroad, what we learn from our experience to the Philippines, and uh, to allow the, uh, the new generation, uh, our students here, to have their own opportunity uh, in uh, entering the space industry. Uh, so maybe what they can do now is uh, study. <laughs> so maybe focus on STEM, on your STEM tracks. So in, it may be engineering. So I think uh, being in aerospace engineering, you have that distinct advantage uh, that you can uh, for satel for for satellites. Uh, they can also go to other related fields such as space sciences, physics. So aside from building natural satellites, we also need to process the data. We also need to go to uh, to develop the payload. So this may be go to geodetic engineering, to uh, information technology, to uh, post-processing environmental sciences. Uh, I think, yeah, it's very broad. Uh, I, the possibilities is broad for you, for, uh, for especially that we know space technology applications uh, have, have many applications in all fields. So maybe, yeah, one is go into STEM, uh, stay in the STEM track, and maybe one more thing is go another step, maybe go to graduate studies. We have opportunities. Uh, uh, if you have opportunities to go to master's here in the Philippines or abroad, that would be great. Go to doctorate, be great. Go to the academe, go back to the serve and that would also be great. So uh, it's a, we, we are trying to have that holistic approach to build our own uh, space uh, ecosystem here in the Philippines. So maybe uh, that's what we are trying to do with Filsa. So maybe some, uh, if Adrian or Director Joel can add to that. Adrian? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I think Caps really answered it, the question well. What I want to emphasize is really, uh, I think that since space is, is very vast, so there are a lot of 
uh, engineering and sciences and even uh, uh, non-technical expertise that can contribute in space. So I think for me, uh, if you are uh, maybe in your senior, in your senior year, perhaps uh, uh, well, if, you're, if you're studying, then you can focus on learning uh, the courses that you that you have in, in, in aerospace engineering. But at the same time, try to find a, you know, a certain field of expertise that uh, you want to concentrate because actually space or aerospace projects, there are people that uh, focus on very narrow field, but there are also people that would focus on uh, inter, uh, multidisciplinary types of activities like systems engineering. So I think it, uh, it is quite flexible in, in, the, in, 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 in the space uh in this space and enter enterprise in general so you can fit in well so what is needed is for you to you know to to develop your skills uh in whatever uh field or you know type of experience that you want to pursue and uh maybe you know i i believe really that uh there are opportunities out there, maybe foreign or local opportunities, where you can find uh, scholarship scholarships. Uh, yeah, where where you can uh, you can further develop your skills. And uh, yeah, I think even if uh, it's, I think graduate graduate uh, studies is important, but even even uh, in industries you can. Uh, you can go to industries and whatever that are that may be directly or indirectly related to aerospace or space. Those skills are transferable. So you know uh, you might not have the direct you I mean direct opportunity right now to be directly involved in space activities or aerospace activities. But if you go to an industry that you know that. Are, that are related, then those kids are transferable. So there are possibilities you can pursue in the future. So that, that's my uh, addition. So maybe I can add quickly, very quickly to that. No? Um, first of all, um, whatever it is that, that you're doing, whether it's uh, aerospace engineering, mechanical, electrical, uh, civil, chemical, be good at it. Um, and then um, try your best, no? because that's your metric of success. How much um, maybe it, it, the, the, you know, your success is determined by how much effort you put into it. And then and, and, you know, failures will come, but the important thing is to pick yourself up after the failure. You know? In some places, uh, failure is kind of a badge of honor. You talk about Silicon Valley and the startups that have failed there because they emerge better from it uh, and they, they move on to bigger things. Um, so yeah, be, be good in, 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 in what you're trying to do and then develop um, communication skills, develop um, teamwork, skills, you know, um, project management, um, empathy is an important trait because in order to build, so in order to build bigger systems, in order to address societal challenges, right? In order to address societal scale challenges, you need, we need interdisciplinary teams. So we can't solve it alone through aerospace engineering or mechanical or electrical engineering. The satellite is a testament to that. It's an area where different fields converged, the scientists and engineers, and believe me, even the economists and the social scientists are there. FILSA is hiring economists and social scientists as well, apart from people in the natural uh, sciences and mathematics and engineering. No? Okay, so you need to have empathy in, in order for you to, to, to come up and form an interdisciplinary team because interdisciplinary teams are the ones that solve societal challenges. Okay, so don't just solve a chemistry problem, solve a clean energy problem. Right? And that's where you will have more impact. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marciano, uh, Engineer Violan and Engineer Sosses. And uh, for our final question, uh, we actually have a lot of questions. Uh, if you look at here at the chat, uh, our students have prepared a lot of questions, but uh, due to our time constraints, we'll have to uh, go with our last question. So 
final question, realistically, what challenges are there? I think you mentioned this a while ago, Doctor. Uh, so what challenges are there for the Philippines to be able to locally manufacture our own satellite modules and maybe in the future launch our own rockets? And in connection to that question, uh, what future do you want uh, with your position as the Director General, uh, Dr. Joel, and for Engineer Salces as part of uh, Philippine Space Agency. Um, and so in connection to that, what is you, what future do you see for the Philippines in terms of space endeavors and for the Philippines in general? So two-part question. The first one, what, is, what challenges are there for us to be able to manufacture our satellites and maybe launch our own rockets and then maybe send a man into the moon or out to space. And for the next part, what is your dream? Uh, what future uh, do you see for the Philippine space endeavors? Okay, let, let me ad address the glory if I may go ahead. Uh, the first one. Um, when we when we say we want to increase, uh, we want to build our own satellites. No? I don't think there's really such a thing as 100% everything uh, Philippine uh, made. No? Even products that we're proud of, that we think are Philippine products, like San Miguel beer, has components uh, coming or ingredients coming from other countries that are sourced elsewhere. Uh, but the, the important thing is we put it together, right? We have the intellectual property that we, when, we think, when we make things functional, we take from wherever they may come from, from um, the places where they may be doing it best. We put it here and then we put it together. And that's that final product is the one that has the most value right? Not the individual components. We talk about value proposition, and that's something that the space agency, our space agency focuses on, value creation and value addition. If we do something, does it create value? And that's a, that's a test for us, right? Um, because in the situation of our country, we have many pressing challenges, and we're con cognizant of all of that. So by accessing space, you know, because precisely we have pressing challenges, that's why we need to be in space because space is a venue where we can empower ourselves. We can put satellites up there that will give us data and information. We can put telecommunication satellites that will address the digital divide uh, and bridge this gap in, in rural places, right? So that, that's our motivation. So um, of course we take the best, whether it's Philippine, uh, made by Philippine companies or made by uh, others outside, and we bring it to our source, we put it together here, we add value to it. And by doing it that way, we create value and we retain the value. We create jobs in the Philippines, we contribute to our economy, we even export it. Now we, be, we become an exporter of technology rather than a net importer of technology. So that's, that's also related to the second question of what, what our vision is. You know? By creating value in the Philippines and retaining value in the Philippines as enabled by space, we will become a more um, significant global player in space contributing value not just for filipinos but for the rest of the world right so um and we talk about rockets for example um certainly we cannot access space without rockets so right now we're depending on our partners um whether we build rocket facilities in the philippines we also have to look at it from an economic perspective right? maybe it's a platform for international cooperation the indonesians are looking to build one the thais are looking to build one even the malaysians so if each country starts to have its own rocket launch facility will that make economic sense for everybody to be to be why don't we just cooperate so maybe that's that's something a direction for for all of us then it, it's uh, at, at the same time we pull each other up together rather than compete we cooperate so i think that's that's a very fertile ground for international cooperation and learning from the mistakes of others and not having to start from scratch and everything. You know? okay. um, and with regard to astronauts, certainly uh, that is something that we all dream of, right? And we dream of the day that we have a Philippine flag planted somewhere outside of earth, right? And in space. Um, we also have to think about, uh, again, when we talk about value, um, what will our astronaut do in space? Perhaps when we send an astronaut to the ISS, that astronaut should be doing a meaningful experiment born out of local science in the Philippines, right? Maybe we bring our own indigenous uh, ingredients or materials and we try to uh, test new, uh, new, new um, food for astronauts. Or we have an experiment in space born out of local research. So that's something we have to think about. And when we package that together, I think when we put that together in, in the, the aspirations of an astronaut, a Filipino astronaut, it makes more sense in terms of uh, being uh, acceptable 
to society because our astronaut, apart from instilling national pride, will also do something meaningful for mankind, right? Because there's an experiment being done, a Philippine experiment being done in space. So that, that's what I think, you know, as far as our goals and aspirations and, and all those topics, um, we all yearn to uh, send Filipinos in space. We all yearn to explore other galaxies and other planets and even Mars because we have this collective yearning to understand our origins and whether there are others out there. So that is natural. You know, that is something that, that every human being yearns for. And hopefully our country will contribute to that in the near to medium, uh, near, uh, medium to long term because uh, space is a marathon, it's not a sprint. So when we put up a space agency, it's because we're in there for the long term, in the long run. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joel. Um, I think right now my mind is blown. Um, this is the closest that uh, we had ever in our university to, this is the closest that we got to space really. Um, we would like to express our gratitude to our guest so, speakers for this afternoon. And me. yes, sir. Dr. Eji, Dr. Turing yes. to one. Yes, Dr. Turing would like to express that gratitude, sir. Um, if we can point our screen to Dr. Jovenal Turing, founder of Indiana Aerospace University. Um, he will be presenting our token of gratitude to our three speakers for this afternoon. As, yes, sir, Jovenel. Yes, sir. He has a question, sir, Edgy. Yes, yes. Um, Dr. Machan. Dr. Joel. Mayong hapon po. By the way, uh, are you related to my good friend Joel Marciano from Las Piñas before? He was. He is my late father, sir. Joel Marciano. I'm a junior. Yes. Oh, really? My God. Uh, I, I trained him. I was the president of the, the Las Piñas JC in 1981. We were neighbors at Pillar Village. Are you there? No, sir. I moved to Quezon City. I've uh, moved north from uh, Las Piñas. <laughs> It's nice to meet How you, Paul. Yes, yes. How is Joel now? Oh, sorry, he passed in uh, 2008. Yes, um, he, he used to be my errand boy, you know, when, when I stayed in Las Piñas since 1969. I see. Oh my gosh. How is your mama, mother? Uh, happily harvesting mangoes in Oriental Mindoro, po. Uh, she may regards to him. I'm, I'm, I'm Tito Jovi of Alabang and Las Piñas. Huh? Okay, sir. Uh, she may regards to him. You know, uh, our country, uh, we are realizing now the acute shortage of land. That's why if you happen to be to drop by at Indiana in Mactan, uh, we have a condominium. Lots now are very expensive. They, we have the land on the skies, you know. Yeah, napakahirap, napakamalang luti ngayon. Kaya we are utilizing the, aeros the airspace. And uh, we are now uh, also consider um, diverting our investment in Ormok. And, uh, you know, when I passed Ormok, I happened to, drop, I happened to cross the geothermal area in Ormok. So, um, Probably we will not concentrate only on satellite or whatever, no. But uh, the airspace, we are we have acute shortage of plans in the Philippines. Very expensive now. We are in the condominium business. Indiana is associated with Indiana Condominium Hotel and the Tito Jobe Condominium in Alabang. Very expensive. That's part of also of airspace. That's why it happens to I. That's why. I was able to, to put up this university and, and I, and that day it used to be an Indiana school of aeronautics, but now hindi na usong aeronautics, eh. pag ganun yung aeronautics, yun yung si aerospace pataas, eh, papunta sa taas. So I suggest uh, if we can concentrate more on, on this area, not only on satellite and whatever. 
Well, well and look at that, po, uh, sir. Although I think, um, you know, what was established by our law is a space agency, uh, not really an aerospace agency. So to that extent, we have to cooperate and work with uh, the Aerospace Industries Association of the Philippines, and also for aviation, of course, it's CAAP. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so yung po, I think that that's how we're going to handle it. It's a multi-sector um, engagement between the aviation and aerospace and space. Uh, space being above the Karman line, no, 100 kilometers. So I think that's uh, that's kind of a demarcation. So, yeah. And, and one more, Joel. Uh, I I just uh, drafted. I just sent a letter to the to Chairman uh, 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 Secretary Lorenzana of the IATF, requesting intervention if you can return back to face to face, because you cannot, uh, you know. The, the the power of Republic Act 11363, which is known as Space Agency, cannot be properly implemented. Pagka online, we need to be face to face. No, if you can sound this off. No, I, I have written uh, Secretary Lorenzana and uh, Senator Bongo about this, and probably can receive my letter next week. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Dr. Paul. Jovenel, and thank you also to Dr. Joel Marciano. So again, as a token of gratitude, Indiana Aerospace University would like to present this replica of Indiana Aerospace University's first training aircraft, number RPC-50, to Dr. Joel Joseph Marciano, Jr., Engineer Adrian Salces, Engineer Edgar Paolo Violan, being the resource speaker in the webinar entitled PH to Space, Ascent to Inspire, given this 11th day of December 2020, signed by Dr. Jovenel B. Turing, IAU president and founder. Thank you so much, Dr. Marciano, Engineer Salsas, Engineer Viola. Uh, this has been nothing short of eye-opening. Um, when you said, sir, that space is a venue to empower ourselves, uh, for a while, I completely had a glimpse of what that would have, but um, this has been um, eye-opening, mind-altering, and, and it's been a pleasure to hear the three of you as you share your experiences, your knowledge um, to empower our students, PH to space, ascent to inspire, and I think our webinar has done just that, uh, our students are inspired. Our students are now more than ever willing and ready to, to go to space. <laughs> so to close our, our activity, um, I would like to call on the department head of the Aerospace Engineering Department, Sir Johnny Destacamento for his closing remarks. All right. um, uh, ladies and, and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, delivering a closing remarks for me is, is a twofold task. First, um, I considered it a sad task, especially so that we shall be closing a door in a very interesting and a very lively discussion. On the other hand, it is also an honor and a privilege to be a part of this um, undertaking. So in conclusion, this webinar, has been very outstanding as our minds and hearts has been filled with ideas, information and vision coming from no other than the prime movers of our very own Philippine Space as, as per Sir Eddie. So in my capacity as the head of the Aerospace Engineering Department, I'd like to express our utmost gratitude to those who have contributed to the success of I shall mention to Ms. Michelle Mendoza for spearheading this webinar, to the current batch of officers, kudos for a job well done, to the members of the faculty of the College of Aerospace Engineering, thank you for your support, to Engineer Gallius who have taken an extra mile in hosting this webinar, thank you. So another career I think or I'm sure is in store for you. To the IAO administration, to our South Directress, Madam Luz Cahayagan, to our Dean of Colleges, Dr. Nonita Piligaspi, to our Chief Executive Officer, 
Mr. Harold Turing, and to our founder and president, Dr. Jovinal P. Turing, thank you for the resources and the support for the success of this event. Most of all, to our esteemed speakers, Dr. Adrian Salces, Engineer Edgar Paolo uh, Violan, and um, the Director General of the Philippine Space Agency, Dr. Joel Joseph Mariano. We can thank you enough for spending your precious time with us, such an inspiration. Indeed, there is a lot to reflect and to ponder upon from the challenges that from the challenge that is being posed by Sir Harold in his opening remarks to, to the very inspiring journey that, be, that uh, are being shared by Dr. Salces and Engineer Violan to the challenge and to the realization that was given to us by Dr. Marciano. Our hope is that we can be a better individuals. We can we can transform into a T-shaped individuals, and we can enhance our collective efforts and can translate towards nation building. So it's been an inspiring day. So let me end by saying, uh, mabuhay filsa and mabuhay aerospacers. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much, uh, Engineer Adrian, Dr. Marciano, for spending the afternoon with us. So Sir Johnny uh, said it best. And um, so that's it for this afternoon. Um, maybe we can ask if uh, the doctor and uh, engineer Salces are still available, if they have any parting words for us, or if they're available to share few words so we can end. Yeah, let, let me just say thank you once again. And uh, I, again, as I mentioned, I always look forward to engaging with uh, the universities and the academe. That's been my home for 26 years uh, before moving to DOST and uh, Filsa. So, uh, well, thank you. And it's um, you know, likewise a pleasure to, to be here. And um, maybe also I've seen several questions in the chat box. What uh, perhaps can be done is you can email it to uh, our email address info at filsa.gov.ph and we will try our best to answer some of them even after the event. Um, and some of our staff and engineers and scientists can also contribute answers to the questions that you have. Uh, so that's it. Uh, again, thanks for the opportunity and uh, again, see, you, uh, see you again soon. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Marciano. In person. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marciano. So that's it for this afternoon. Um, it's safe to say that PH to Space Ascent to Inspire has been a successful event. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Hope to see you again in the future webinars that we have. And this will not be the last Endeavor to Space. So signing off, that's it for this afternoon. Thank you and congratulations, Sir Johnny and Sir A.G. A round of applause for you. Thank you, Ma'am Dean. To Ms. Michelle Mundi. And uh -huh. yes, for, to Ms. Michelle, Michelle Mendoza. Mendoza. Ma Ma Congrats. Congrats. Yes. You're heading this Michelle. Thank you. Good job to all the CYAE yeah. officers. Ma'am Luz, thank you. Yes. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Ma'am Dean. Sir, did it among pictorial? Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the five of us or <laughs> no, with the speaker, I think they are still here. Or I don't know. Napa I think they are in a hurry to leave. Yeah. Napa. Yeah, no, they are no busy people. Around. They're no longer around. Sir Rod, thank you. Thank you, Sir Rodney. Thank you, there was something Harold, wrong with Dr. my. Jovenal, thank you so much. Boss, thank you for being here mm -hmm. with us. Small world. Boss. Congrats, Edgy, Johnny. Thank you, Harold, thank you thank so you, much, sir. Thank you, sir. Everyone, congrats. Boss, thank you, everyone. And Sir Harold, Harold, thank you so much. Thank you, very special. Thank you so much. Sa so, mga Facebook friends there, thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned many things and explore yeah. the world.
about aerospace engineering and come and enroll in IAU. See you soon. Okay. Thank you. We're still live in, a, in FB.